Good evening. Welcome to Ask 11. I'm your host, Tracy Christensen. Finding quality childcare can sometimes be difficult, but we hope to make that process a little bit easier with the information we share tonight. During this hour, we'll answer questions that you may have about finding the right childcare for your children. And our phone lines are open, and we invite you to call in with your questions, concerns, or experiences about childcare. The toll-free number to reach us is 855-801-1980. And that number will be at the bottom of your screen throughout the evening. So joining us tonight to help answer your questions is Simone Bolivar, who currently serves as the administrator of the Child Care Licensing Program in the state of Utah. Simone has 17 years of experience working with young children. Thanks for sharing your time with us tonight, Simone. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. This is a really important topic, and some people might assume that most of our viewers stay at home with their children and don't need child care providers. What kind of need do you know exists in Utah and throughout the country for these services? Well, with the growing need of uh, women, especially going to work outside their homes, uh, they're in need of uh, a place where to take their children. So the, the need is growing dramatically. So we have about 50% of uh, uh, the children in Utah placed in childcare centers or family providers. That's a lot. That's a lot. 50%. Tell us about what your licensing program does exactly. Well, the uh, Child Care Licensing Program is part of the Bureau of Child Development, which is uh, in the uh, Department of Health. And we uh, have different programs, all uh, working for the uh, development of the children in Utah. We have, uh, um, we establish the rules and enforce the rules to make sure that children in child care uh, uh, places regulated places are keeping the rules and are providing safe and healthy environments for the children. Okay, so you mentioned regulated providers because there's a difference between regulated and non. What's that? Okay, yes. Uh, we have different uh, types of regulated programs. We have family child care uh, license providers, those providers who provide, uh, who give uh, the service to children in their houses, but they have a license to work in their houses. Or we have centers. These centers are not in the house of the provider, but a different building in which they have children and they are also licensed by the state. Okay, and you mentioned some rules. Yes. What are some rules. of the rules that these providers have to abide by? Well, we have different rules and these rules again are to make sure that the health and safety of the children is first. Uh, so we have rules, for example, for indoors and outdoors. We have rules, for example, if the provider, uh, how many children the provider can care for. We have rules for supervision, uh, the, the time the provider needs to be with the children and, and, and provide everything that they need. Uh, we have rules like, for example, providers need to have a plan uh, for emergencies or providers need to make sure that every person that is in direct supervision or in direct contact with the children have a background check mm -hmm. and well and there are many others for example with playground equipment they have to keep certain rules to make sure that this equipment is uh, what the children need according to their age and mm -hmm. that is safe for them so that rule book is pretty thick one it is, it is. <laughs> and it's all for the health and safety and of the children. Of the children. Yes. yes, it is just to help. Absolutely. Because that's one of the responsibilities we have. We have to make sure that uh, we have to support working parents to make sure that their children are in, uh, in, in a safe and healthy uh, place when, while they're working. Tonight we're talking with Simone Bolivar and he has a lot of experience with child care and in the Utah State Department of Health child care licensing program. So we invite all of you who are viewing tonight, you might have some questions or concerns about finding child care for your child. You can call in a uh, toll free number 855-801-1980 and call and ask your questions to Simone. Tell me about something that is rewarding about your job. You've obviously seen a lot of things good and not so good about child care providing. Well, that is true. And one of the best experiences that I've had is just uh, seeing a child develop in the right way, having what that child needs, uh, seeing a provider that loves what she or, or he does, and taking that child by the hand and taking uh, the, the necessary steps to make sure that that child receives uh, what he or she needs. 
and uh, at the end of the process, seeing how that child goes into elementary school and be successful and have good relationships with other people and has what the parents were not perhaps able to provide at home because they had to go and work. So uh, seeing children uh, thrive and, and progress is, is rewarding always. And I'm sure that's the kind of atmosphere that every parent wants to find. And we have a caller on the line from Spanish Fork. Sarah, what's your question for Simone? Hi, I'm wondering uh, how parents can get information about these registered child care uh, helpers or providers and, and their compliance with the various rules. Thanks, Sarah. Do you have a number or Yes, website? this is a very good question. Our website is health.utah.gov slash licensing. And parents can go to our website and find numbers, phone numbers where they can call, depending on the area they live, mm -hmm. and call us. We can give them information about that child care provider. We can tell them how many children that provider can care for, if they're licensed, and if uh, there have been any violations to the rules which is very important for them to know. So, yeah, they can call us at any time and we'll give them that information too. That is excellent. What a great resource. And that website is on our screen now. And you want to repeat it again? Yes, it is health.utah.gov slash licensing. So you guys have done all the work for our parents. If they can just go and enter their city and, and right. find some good resources. Right, there are links there uh, that they can go to and see not only our phone numbers, if they're looking for a good place to take their kids, there are also links to other uh, resources like child care resource and referral. We'll, uh, they'll give them information on where to go and, and, and what type of providers to look for. Excellent, and you mentioned the, the great result that happens when a uh, provider is following all the rules and acting in the child's best interest. What kinds of things do you look for as you or your licensors go into a facility that make it an excellent place? Well, making it a, an excellent place doesn't depend on what we do only. Providers do a great job. Providing care is not easy. It's not only watching the kids, it's doing many things. And I applaud their efforts to do great things. We have wonderful providers in the state. What we do, we are a regulatory agency. So we do about twice every year to do two different inspections. One of the inspections is announced, so the provider knows that we're coming. Okay. And we go over paperwork with them. We go and do check the facility to make sure that everything is uh, okay. We go outside and inside. We uh, do a very uh, important inspection during that time and it takes some time sure. then the next inspection will be unannounced so the provider will know that we're coming and we just come unexpected and check some basic things and make sure that uh, the kids are okay that uh, there are no more kids than uh, the provider is allowed to have and check for some uh, s uh, safe and healthy regulations that they have to keep all the time so basically we do those two inspections. We also uh, do um, when provider, when parents or any provider or any person has a complaint and call us and let us know that something is perhaps not working well, they can call us, file a complaint, and we'll go and investigate that complaint to make sure that what, what we have been told is true. So we go and announce on those complaints too. Well, that's excellent. Do you investigate every complaint? Uh, not every complaint, but we receive every single complaint. If we have a person who calls with a complaint that is more than six weeks old, we normally don't uh, go and investigate that complaint. But if there is a reason for us to think that there is something wrong, we can refer that complaint to other agency. We have a caller on the line from Sandy. Lee, do you have a question for Simone? Yes, um, I have two questions actually. Um, what does it cost to get a, ch a license to be a child care provider? And, and what kind of insurance do you have to have? Okay, that's a good question. The costs, well, it depends on what type of license you're looking for. If you are looking to be a family child care provider, it is normally $25. There are other costs involved, like you have to go to your city and get a business license, and it varies according to the city you're from. You have to get um, your um, 
TB test, which is the tuberculosis test, and some other costs that go with the license, but from us, it will be only $25. If you're planning on having a center, you, it'll be also $25, but uh, in addition to this, we, you'll have to add $1.50 cents per every child that you are planning on having as uh, the number of children allowed for your license. Simone, how many licensed providers are there in the state of Utah? Well, we have about... Uh, Off the top a, of your head. That's fine. Over a thousand family providers right now and about 300 center providers and that are licensed. Okay. Excellent. Thanks for calling, Lee. And we want to remind all of our viewers that you can call in and ask any questions that you might have about finding or keeping good child care. And that toll-free number is 855-801-1980. And you can also visit us on kbyu11.org. We're talking with Simone Bolivar from Utah's Child Care Licensing Program. Simone, uh, what has your department discovered to be one of the most often violated rules? Well, that's a good question too. We're often asked that question. And the one that we find to be out of compliance uh, is supervision. We have so, some rules in supervision and it is important for uh, parents to understand that we want their children to be supervised all the time, even when they're sleeping when they're playing outside, when they're inside, when they're watching a little clip, or when they're anytime, they need to be supervised by, that, by an adult that can respond to their needs. And that's kind of the rule that we find uh, violated the most. So when you come in unannounced, you sometimes see that. And that, you know, as a parent, of course, that's it is important what, for you to know that, what yes. I would want to have. And now, if I were to go and visit a child care facility in hopes that they might provide service for my family. What would you recommend be the three most important things I look hmm. for? Oh, well, that's a good question. That I want to see or that I don't want to see? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. There are many very important things that you need to look for. I'll say that one of them will be uh, communication. You need to make sure that the person or the people you're leaving your child with has the ability to communicate with you and with your child. So. The, you can establish a good relationship with them, ask questions, be asked questions, because it's not only for you to get your child there, but also during the time your child is with them, you have to be able to communicate all the time with them. Second, that their facility, you, you need to be able to walk the facility and see what they have, what they do, and see that they have a program, that they have, uh, uh, for example, a, an activity a plan for the children, uh, that they have uh, an emergency plan, that they have policies and procedures, that those things are available to you as a parent. Mm -hmm. So those things are, are very important. And well, uh, I'll add one more. Okay. And, and this one will be that those that are caring for those children love doing what they're doing. Because if they don't like what they're doing, that's not the right fit. I'm sure it takes just a special kind of person to do that for a job, day in and day out. It does. It does. Not everyone is made for children, and we have to understand that, yes. So. Simone, we have another question for yeah. you from Rachel in Park City. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Um, my question today is, I, I've been babysitting children for a while, and I'm wondering when I need to be licensed. Like, is there a limit with how many children or, you know, like what... What kind of situation, what, when do I need to get a license? Well, excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Yes, uh, according to the state uh, rules, every person that is uh, taking care of uh, four or more children should have a license. And uh, if you're caring for more, uh, four or more children, you should have a license. If you're caring for uh, less than four hours a day, uh, you, don't have a you don't need a license. But if you're caring for children for, um, four or more hours a day and you have uh, more than four children, you will need a license. Okay, and they can do that by contacting your office? Yes, they just uh, call one of, the, uh, one of our uh, three regions. Uh, again, they go to our website. If they know, don't know the phone number, go to either one of our three regions and make a phone call. They'll send them a packet. This uh, uh, is information about the types of licenses that we have. 
so they can see what they really want, what type of license they want to have, and they'll sign up for an orientation, which is free also for the state, and uh, we'll tell them all of the uh, uh, requirements that they'll have to get this license done. Good. Now, we talked a little bit before about the possibility of a parent filing a complaint mm -hmm. against a child care provider. Are there certain rights that a provider has in that type of situation where maybe there's a wrongful complaint filed? Well, that, that's true. And not every single complaint is um, sustained. I mean, it's not uh, true. But it is important for parents to understand that they have the right to, to contact someone, in this case, to contact us. And if they have any valid concern, they should call us and, and file that complaint, and we'll go and investigate. Providers will have the opportunity to, to prove and, and, and see if that complaint is true or not, and will, according to the rules, will be able to either substantiate the complaint or not. Every single provider has the right also to appeal any finding. So both sides are protected. Parents need to know that they can complain, and providers have also the opportunity to appeal the findings. So if, if it is something wrong or if uh, there is something that they're falsely ac accused, they can also appeal that finding. Do you recommend to parents that if they have something they're concerned about at their provider that they just directly approach the caregiver and talk about that situation? Well, it depends on the situation. And most opportunities, it's good for the parent to talk to the provider and discuss. Uh, is perhaps a misunderstanding or the parent or the provider uh, doesn't have the right information on, on something, the program um, uh, policies and procedures, or the uh, provider doesn't know what the likes and dislikes of the parents are. Yeah. So it's good to talk to the provider. But if there is a bigger concern, for example, uh, in a home provider uh, setting, someone new moved in and uh, you kind of don't trust that person, you can call us. And because every person that lives in that house, in this case, in, in home providers, need to have a background check. Mm. So if you have concerns, it doesn't hurt to ask. And parents have that intuition sometimes. It's good to follow that. Right. Yes, it is your child. Tell us about the background checks. Every person in a home care situation that would live in that house, whether if somebody got a new roommate or an older child moved home, those people would have to have a background check. And in a center, every single employee has a that background check? That is true, check? yes. And every person in the home, uh, t um, 12 years of age and older, would have to have a background check. And it, at a center, every single person that is in, in contact with the children will have to have a background check. And who carries out the background checks? And what kinds of things would be uncovered and what might not be in a background check? Well, we... If I were to go get one. Right. Okay. We have our own unit. Our unit investigates and does the background checks. And we uh, basically... Um, check on every single uh, misdemeanor A that the person has. We also check uh, juvenile courts and see if they have any um, problems in their past that will uh, impede them uh, from being close to the children. And if there is something, that, if there is a finding, we'll get in contact with that person and let that person know that he or she is not allowed to be at the place where the children are being cared for. Okay, so have you had to close Child care facilities? Yeah, sadly, yes. Yes, in some opportunities we have had to close some providers, both centers and homes, um, for different reasons. Sometimes the rules are not being kept, and uh, in some opportunities it's not safe for the children. So, yes, we'll close that provider, and we have. But that's so comforting, you know, to parents who are entrusting their children to the care of those people that some someone like your agency is looking out for the children. I know of a single mom who was very young and trying to finish school who had to have her daughter in a child care facility and I'm wondering if there is some financial help available for maybe single parents or anybody that might need some help in that type of an emergency situation. Well, yeah, uh, the state has different programs. For example, if they go to jobs.utah.gov, they can apply right there. And the Department of Workforce Services will provide the help they need to not only, well, to find the financial means to provide that care for their children. 
uh, okay. we have many people using this kind of help. We have a caller on the line. It's Bryce from Tuwilla. Bryce, what's your question for Simone? Um, during these difficult um, economic times, um, child care, of course, can get a little expensive. What uh, kind of ratio should a person keep in mind when looking for affordable child care? Is there a, a formula or it should, like, 25% uh, of your, 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 debt, your monthly salary, what should a person keep in mind when looking for the, the right amount of money to spend for child care? Thanks, Bryce. <laughs> Very good question. Well, I, I cannot give you the, the exact amount that you should look for, but if you contact the Child Care Resource and Referral, they'll give you some amounts and, and, and how much people in your area are charging for child care. They'll give you information on how much centers charge and how much home providers charge. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, put the numbers together and calculate how much you can pay or you're willing to pay. But yes. See if they're in the ballpark of the normal Correct. range. Yes. That's, yeah, because it, it varies. It varies, but child care resource and referral again, which is, is uh, uh, we have the link to their phone numbers also in our website, can tell you more information, more detailed information on, on, on how much they'll charge. Great. We love the calls that we're getting from our viewers, and we want to remind you that you can call the number on your screen, which is 855-801-1980, and talk with Simone. We have a caller on the line from Orem, Utah. Hi, Wendy. I just have a quick question. Um, are there any services for special needs kids in Utah for daycare? That's a great question, and as a mom of a special needs child, I know that there are some you know, things to consider. That's right. Everything depends on the age of your child, also what kind of needs that child has. So, yes, we have, for example, if your child is uh, within the ages of zero and three, you can also use the um, uh, different programs in the state. We have links in our website for those children. But if you're looking for a child care place that will address those needs, you have to decide first what is it that you need. And again, uh, uh, if you look for a child care resource and referral, they'll tell you which places provide that kind of uh, special care that you Maybe need. some additional medically trained Right, because it, it varies a lot from need to need. So yeah. special needs vary a lot. So it depends on what you need. You'll have to look for the right place, and the child care resource and referral will give you that information. Okay. Thank you, Simone. You have a wealth of knowledge, and I'm glad that our viewers can go to your website and get more information that they might need. We appreciate you taking time to be with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Now let's take a look at a short video about the importance of quality child care. Time to say, sit down. For children at risk, preschool is a way to give them the nurturing attention they may be missing at home. And it's had positive, long-range effects. For every dollar invested in programs like these, it's been estimated that society gets back seven, with fewer criminal arrests, a greater number of high school graduates, and more productive citizens. But even for children not at risk, preschool is a valuable experience. It gives them the chance to interact with people their own age and to learn new things. The earlier education starts, the more power it has, helping the brain to grow more connections. If the preschool is aimed at letting a child learn about him or herself, and learn about others, and learn how to control his environment, to use his environment, it's a wonderful thing. But not all facilities are as good as this one. In fact, it's estimated that 40% of all infants and toddlers are in care that is actually destructive to them. If you think that's shocking, consider this. Right now, there are over 10 million children enrolled in some form of daycare. And with more parents entering the workforce and reform aimed at employing welfare mothers, the number of child care programs is expected to grow by 50% in the next 10 years. That's why it's so important for parents to take an active role in selecting the best daycare possible for their children. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with any setting where there are multiple adults who are willing to be nurturing, consistent, predictable, and loving. The problem is that very few daycares have the ratio of adults to children. It's got to be safe. It's got to be 
provide decent nutrition, all those things, but it's also got to provide people that want to interact with babies and that have the time to. That means a ratio, not more than three babies to one caregiver and uh, four toddlers to one caregiver. One of the best ways to ensure high quality care for your child is to make sure the facility is accredited. Then check it out in person and ask yourself the following questions. Is there a good teacher-student ratio? Are the children absorbed in what they're doing? Do they seem happy? Do the adults speak respectfully to the children and encourage them to express their thoughts and feelings? Do they like their work? Are they down on the floor playing with the children? It's also a good idea to know if they welcome parental involvement. If the answers are yes, you found the right place. Daycare should be more than a drop-off service. Children need to be growing and learning while they are there. Are we ready to count how many days we've had in November? One, two, three. We'd like to remind you that our phone lines are open and you're welcome to call in with your questions at the number listed at the bottom of your screen. It's 855-801-1980 and it's a toll-free call. As we continue our discussion about finding quality childcare, we're joined now by Carrie Phillips, a home provider training specialist, and Joyce Hastings, a center training specialist, both of whom are with the Utah Department of Health's licensing program. Carrie and Joyce, we're glad that you could be with us tonight. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it's very interesting and an important topic. Tell me, your titles are barely different. What's the difference between your responsibilities and what you do? Go ahead, Carrie. Well, as her titles say, I am the home provider training specialist, so my job is specific to training people who do childcare in their homes or where they live. And Joyce trains the people who do childcare in centers or out of their home. Great. Tell us about the trainings that you provide when and where are they held? We do quite a few different trainings. One of the first trainings we do is for people who are interested in becoming licensed, and that is called our orientation training. And then we also provide ongoing rules training for those who are already licensed or our residential certificate for families. And it's really helpful for us. We go throughout the whole state. Um, we try to provide great information for them. We also provide um, trainings to those that are and different agencies are in the community at different conferences, different associations, and try to make sure that we get the information out to those who are interested. Okay. Yeah, we are available if anybody is interested in having us come to do a training. We are available. We can work that in our schedule. They just need to call and we'll set that up. Sounds like a great resource. And I want to talk more about the specific topics you cover. We have a caller now, Bonnie. What are your questions for Carrie and Joyce? Um, is there any studies or research? Do children do better? Like, fair enough. Okay, are there studies about how children uh, succeed yeah, that's or a, not? That's actually a really good question. There are several different people that have done different studies showing positives or negatives towards children who go to child care providers or those who remain in the home. And in my opinion, it's inconclusive as far as that goes. Some people will say that it's better, some people will say that it's not. So it's really a parental choice. And I'm sure it has to do with the care at each individual Definitely. place or even right. in the home. You Definitely, know? Right. sure. <laughs> it depends what the interaction is there with the children. And what are the different trainings that you give? Oh, we do trainings. I'll do trainings for providers on what they can expect when they have an inspection from licensing. We do trainings on all the rules, so let them know what's, what, how they can be in compliance with like the rules on supervision and ratios and infection control and injury prevention. So the whole gambit we will do trainings on. In addition, providers are required to receive training on how to do positive guidance, um, child um, development. They're required to receive it on SIDS and shaken baby syndrome if they care for infants and toddlers and coping with crying babies. So there's other trainings that they are required to receive annually in addition to the ones that we provide. And providers are not required at all to take our trainings. They're all voluntary, they're all free, but we do want to make sure that it's available to them and they know where they can get those trainings. But you're saying they are required to do some kind of continuing education type thing yearly? Yes. In fact, they're required every year to receive 20 hours of ongoing training. Um, and for 
families, it's a little bit different because there's two different categories. So why don't you talk about that a little bit, Carrie? Yeah, for home child care providers, the state legislature requires that we have two standards of in-home child care. So we do have residential certificate holders and licensed family providers. A licensed family provider is meeting a few more rules, they're more strict, a higher standard, and so they are required to have 20 hours of training a year. A residential certificate holder only needs 10 hours of training per year. And I like the fact that the, um, now the rules require that providers, half of those trainings are face-to-face. -face. So at least 10 hours of those trainings for licensed family or centers is required to be face-to-face. -face. You can be with the meeting with the trainer, getting your questions answered. And then for residential certificate, of course, that's five. I'm sure that's so helpful for them. We have a caller from Salt Lake City, London. Hi. Hi, I'm just wondering, um, how old do you have to be to obtain uh, a license and go through the training sessions and everything? That's a very good question. In order to receive a license or a certificate from the state, you have to be at least 18 years old. However, we will allow a 16 or 17 year old to work in a family child care home as long as they are always in direct supervision with somebody 18 years of age or older. And for centers, it's just a little bit different. Um, there has to be a director um, that is, or a director designee who's in charge at the facility that's 21 years of age or older on all the hours that the center is open and providing care. So if someone's listening right now and being totally overwhelmed by mm -hmm. the rules, tell us how someone can contact you on, online or by phone. I think the easiest way is through our website. Um, it is as Simone had mentioned earlier, if they were watching, it's health.utah.gov slash licensing. And it has our contact information right there. Great. I'm sure there are a lot of people listening, like our last caller, that think, I love children and I would like to become a provider and how can I go about getting licensed? And they can do that through contacting you. What might they expect? You know, how long does that process take and how involved is it? Um, that process for a home provider, can usually take anywhere from two to three months to five to six months, kind of depending on how quick they want to get it done, because there are all those steps Simone t talked about that you need to do, your first aid and CPR, your orientation training, you need to have some inspections done of your home, and so it can take a little bit of time. You can't just come and get a license the same day or within a couple of weeks. So do plan on two to three months to five or six months to get that done. And that's about the same for centers. Um, there is an application process that they go through. They can get that application packet sent to them for the area that they are um, going to be providing care. And then it has a little checklist that they need to go through. And once we have received a completed application, it can take anywhere from 90 to 120 days before they actually get their license. Okay, and all those <coughs> materials, information is on your website? Yes. Great, I'm sure on the flip side, there are probably some people that babysit in their homes in the neighborhoods and they might be listening to you saying, I don't want to go through all that to get licensed and why should I be licensed? What do you say to them? There are some benefits to being licensed. As Simone said, you can take care of up to four unrelated children in your home without a license. But the benefits that are there is you can get referrals to keep the children there from child care resource and referral. They have grants that they can help you build up your program to get equipment and, and materials to help you run a quality child care program. And also the state the Department of Workforce Services will only pay for child care that is in the home of a relative or a licensed facility. And so that's another resource that is available for you to keep that income and keep those slots full of those children you want to care for. Excellent. Does your department also give advice to providers about how much they should charge? Our department does not do that um, because we are regulatory, so we are more ones who have the regulations as far as what they need to do in order to have a license. But there are some resources they can go to. One of the best places to go to is Child Care Resource and Referral. And they have some, they don't, won't give them an exact amount they need to charge, but they do a survey that kind of tells how much people are charging throughout the area, both rural and non-rural so that they will know that what the differences are there. Okay, and you mentioned the rule about caring for four unrelated mm -hmm. children. Is there a limit to related children that can be in the home of a provider? 
There is no regulation in Utah on limiting the number of kids that you are related to that you're taking care of. Okay. Those family children, those children that are in your family, it can be any number. Great. What are some of the topics um, of the trainings that you do for providers? You, you mentioned some of the safety ones. What are some things that maybe even parents could benefit from? Right. The one that I get the most often um, that requested for to provide is supervision ratios and child discipline. Those are the two that I have most frequently that providers ask me to do trainings on. Another common one is infection control, especially this time of year <laughs> with it being the flu season. I bet. So what kind of response do you get from the providers who come to your trainings? We actually have a survey that we have to give to <laughs> oh, the providers and they actually have to fill those out for us and we give those to our supervisors. So, so it's, you know it, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and most of the time they're actually positive. So I'm, it's encouraging to me. I don't know about Carrie. <laughs> I do. It is mostly positive. <laughs> um, I do get a lot of comments from providers that they're really grateful to know exactly what the rule is, what they are required to do. And then those things that we don't regulate so much so that they have flexibility, like in their business practices, what they charge, their hours, those are all things up to the provider. And so they will know what, what is regulated and what isn't regulated. That's great to know. Are, it, are there any studies about sickness in daycare? Are children more likely to get sick if they're in a child care facility than not? It totally depends on the facility and their policies as far as whether they accept children that are ill or not. Um, and it also depends on how cleanly the facility is sure. and things like that. So as far as a, a study that I could quote to you as far as the percentage wise goes, I don't really have that on the top of my head. Just so. everybody has to do what we all have to do. And right, wash exactly. Hands and, exactly. Yeah, we do between. have rules about mm -hmm. infection control and when providers need to wash their hands and to teach the children to wash their hands and the proper way to do it. Because there are studies that show that improperly washed hands are the number one cause of Definitely. infection and disease in child care programs. And so we really regulate that to make sure the toys are being cleaned, the providers are washing their hands, and so we can mitigate those infections and that spread of disease in programs. We're talking tonight with Carrie and Joyce, who are trainers of child care providers. And we want to remind you that you can call in our toll-free number and ask them any questions you might have about child care. And that number is on your screen. We have a caller, Jen, from Orem, Utah. Hi, Jen. Hi. I have a question. Um, I was wondering how old my child should be before I consider putting them into daycare. Thank you very much for your call. That's a really good question and a question that we sometimes get from providers. Mm -hmm. And it's really a parental choice and also upon need when they are um, in need of, of child care. Licensing regulates um, providers that have children in their care that are from birth up to 12 years old. And so that's as far as regulatory, that's what we do. But as far as need goes is where an, a child would have to be, go into care. Sometimes okay. it's hard for those mothers to leave those little infants. And, but sometimes there's a big need to also do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree. Is there a rule about vaccination before a child goes into daycare? Maybe like this young mother wanting to, or needing to send a young child in, is that? Yeah, there is an immunization rule and we do require that all child care facilities be in compliance with the immunization rule. And in Utah, any child in a child care program is required to be current on their vaccinations or if they, have, if they are behind when they need to go into childcare, they need to have at least one dose of each required vaccination and a written schedule to get caught up when they can. And then another thing they can do also, because Utah does allow people to be exempt mm -hmm. from immunizations, they can do that by being either for personal, religious, or medical reasons, but they have to get a form from the local health departments on that. So they have to actually go through that process. They to just be have to go to, to a local health department, yes, to be exempt from it. Will you mention your website again so that our viewers can check sure. that out, all those resources? Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, our website is health, H E A L T H, dot Utah, spelled out, dot gov, slash licensing, L I C E N S I N G. Thank you. I bet you guys have some good stories, maybe some not so good, and some good ones about what you've learned as you've worked with child care providers. Can you share something that might be helpful to our viewers? One thing that I really enjoy about working with providers <laughs> is that for the majority, 
the providers are in it because they love the children. They don't get paid a lot. It's not a, a job that they get wealthy off of. So they want to do it and they want to do a good job. And so that's the, probably the most rewarding thing that I have with, with working with children and working in childcare. And you, yeah, we do have stories, stories that help illustrate why we have certain rules and, and th why those rules are in place because we really work hard to make all of our rules evidence-based. So the rules are not there just because somebody decided it was a good rule, <laughs> but because there are experiences that happen and why we have that rule. So for example, we have one rule that requires providers to have regular fire drills. And those drills need to be uh, held on different days of the week and different times of the day. And some providers wonder why we require that. But it is to help the provider know how children are going to react at different times of the day. So for example, we had a child care center. They had a class of two-year-olds and did a fire drill while the two-year-olds were eating lunch. Now those two-year-olds were so well trained every single one of them cleaned up their lunch plate oh. before they went outside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And That's if they so had cute. not done a drill during lunchtime, they would not have known they needed to teach those kids if the building's on fire, you can leave lunch on the table. We just need to get out. <laughs> we gotta go. <laughs> and so we want them to do it at different times of the day so they know that they can get all the kids out and how the kids are gonna react. That's a great story. And I really liked how um, a center actually took the bull by the horns when it came to that um, having to document that fire drills and making sure those were done because sometimes parents don't realize the importance of clocking their children in and out at centers mm -hmm. um, and being able to sign them in and out and a center actually chose to make document the parents that did not clock the children in or out that particular day and when they had their fire drill she highlighted them and as they returned back to the facility she said now if your child since your child was not clocked in, we documented it so that we knew they were here, but if we would not have known that, we would not have sent the firemen back into the facility to find the wow. child if there was a fire. So it really helped the parent to understand why we have both those rules. And, and I think it's important, like you say, that the rules are there for the parents and the providers, all for the benefit of the children and make sure they're safe and growing exactly. and learning properly. Now I heard you talk about earlier, Tracy, when you were talking with uh, um, Simone, that you were wondering um, about the rules and which ones are important to follow and what questions the parents can ask. And on our website, we actually have a link to a document that gives good questions for providers to ask and that was not written by us. It's actually done through the Office of Child Care, but good questions to ask providers so that they can great. know what to ask the parents. Because I know that's a hard thing sometimes. What, are, what questions do I really need to ask? Um, and we do have on our website also the rules so the parents can always see what the rules are that are supposed to be following. That's so good, what an excellent resource. Will you say the link to that website excellent, again? Excellent, you bet. We, we say this all day, every day almost. So <laughs> it's help.utah.gov slash licensing. Thank you. you bet. We have a caller, Devin has a question for Carrie and Joyce. Hi, Devin. Hi, my question is, um, can child care providers qualify as homeschoolers? Hmm. That is a good question. It's a home, home question, so I think yeah. that's answered by you. <laughs> um, there is nothing in our rule that would stop a home child care provider from also homeschooling their children as long as they're still able to adequately supervise the children in care and provide that daily activity plan for those children that are in their care so that those kids are getting that appropriate attention and supervision. So they just have to meet the requirements of both the, right. the child care provider and the homeschooling requirements. And so we're talking about activities that a child might do at daycare, like learning. Uh, what other activities should a parent expect their child to do at a provider, not sit in front of a TV screen all day, I'm sure? So licensing actually is under the regulation of only writing rules for the health and safety of children. Okay. So they are required to have some developmental areas on the lesson plans or on their activity plan. Those developmental areas are healthy physical, social emotional, and cognitive language development. Mm -hmm. So those are the three areas that are required to have activities planned for for those children. But what activities they do, licensing does not tell them exactly how they have to do that. We also um, want that to be a parental choice because what is right for one child might not be right for another family. 
That's great. Will you say those three different areas again? Yes, sure. Um, it's a healthy physical, cognitive language, and social emotional development. So every day, something in those areas, but one center or home care provider might go in a certain direction and another and another, and it's just a parental right, choice. Exactly. That's great. Do you have any more stories? Um, let me tell you a couple of things that I think would be helpful for parents. And okay. Carrie, you, you feed off me and tell me a few things, okay? And so it's not a story, but it's, I great. think it's going to be a help. Um, on our website, we have available our interpretation manual. And what our interpretation manual is, is it lists the rules, and this is both for family and for centers. Mm -hmm. And so it lists the rule. The next, after the rule, it also lists the rationale that Carrie referred to earlier. And it talks about the explanation and why we even have it as a rule, so that the parents can say, oh, this is why they have that. And then the next thing um, we have is how it's going to be enforced. Mm -hmm. And it's helpful to have that information so that not only just for the providers, but I think it's great for the parents too, so they can see why they have the rules, why they have to follow them, and then also it helps the providers so they'll know how they're going to be enforced. So they have the same information that a licensor has. That's excellent. We have another call, a question from one of our viewers. This caller is from Payson. Tell me your name and your question. Hello, it's Bob. My question is, uh, how do I know about the security of these child care providers? Uh, how do I know that a stranger isn't going to be able to come pick up my children? Oh, that's scary. Yeah, that, that, that is a scary <laughs> thing. And I'll let her address the homes because it's a little bit different than it is for centers a little bit. Yes, in homes, a provider, we have a rule that says a provider cannot release a child unless they have parental permission. And it needs to be written permission. Mm -hmm. However, in an emergency situation, it can be verbal as long as they can verify the identity of the person giving the verbal permission and the identity of the person picking up the child. So most providers, that well, they are required to have a policy in place where they can do that to make sure they're not releasing the child to somebody who does not have permission from the parent. And it's really a good rule to help make sure those kids aren't going with just a stranger. Absolutely. I, I, you know, sometimes we can think, oh, rules, rules. But as right. a parent, here's an example of where a rule is so important exactly. for the safety of the child. And it is the same for centers as far as having that written parental permission before you release the children. Now, there are some facilities that have chosen to have like locked doors or key, key mm -hmm. doors and things like that. And so those are acceptable, but they are not required as far as the facility goes. Norma from Spanish Fork is on the line with a question. Hi, Norma. Uh, yes, I just had a question about are there um, child care uh, areas for bilingual students or how do I find out if there's any around? Oh, that is a Wonderful really good question. question, exactly. And there in Salt Lake, actually, there's several different, and, and I'm not just singling out Salt Lake, mm -hmm. but there's several different languages. In Utah County, and also I've seen a few also up north, they have a lot that are, are bilingual as far as mm -hmm. Spanish goes. So in, but I, in the more urban areas, there's a lot more different languages, of course, than there are in the rural areas. Um, in homes, I'm sure it's more frequent even than centers. Yeah, there, we have a lot of providers who speak English as a second language. And so if you do some research, you could find those providers. And a really good place to find those providers would be to contact the Child Care Resource and Referral Agency because they would have those providers listed on their database. Sounds like they have so much information. They have a ton. They do. And it, you know, the thing that um, sometimes people will say, well, how come they're not part of licensing? And we help them and they help us, but they can do more of the quality information, mm -hmm. whereas we do the regulatory as far as meeting the bare minimums standards. Okay, great. I think we have another caller on the line. Maybe. Maybe we don't. <laughs> It, from Santa Quinn, it's Ricky. Hi, Ricky. What's your question? Um, I have, I'm, a, I'm a provider, and uh, parents. Um, let me give some advice for when parents won't uh, don't pay regularly, or I think some just make really unreasonable demands. Oh. I mean, you have sample contracts, or, or what do you do? I mean, I, they, have, they have great kids, but the parents are making me crazy. Oh, <laughs> and that, Ricky. that is happens too often, actually. <laughs> that really is a. The business part of doing childcare, like Joyce was saying before, 
Most providers are in this because they really, really like the kids. And sometimes that business part of it is something that is really crucial and you need to do. And there are classes with child care resource and referral. We don't train on that because we're with the health and safety of the kids. But they have classes that will help you with those contracts and those business policies. Their basic child care class is a really good resource mm -hmm. and class to take. And interfacing with other providers and associations, there is a Professional Family Child Care Association in Utah mm -hmm. that will help you with those business practices. Those as are well, two yeah, great resources. Exactly, and as well as there is an association for um, center providers also that they can belong to. So it's really great. Also conferences. There's a three conferences that I know of throughout the, um, in the state that are great for providers to attend that also have helpful information as far as the business practices. But it's probably the most legal um, less liked <laughs> part of doing the business sure. because you love those children and it's very hard to say, you know, you're not paying so I can't watch your children any longer because you feel like you're losing a part of yourself. You develop that close relationship exactly. but you don't, you don't want to talk about that stuff. Right. If, if I'm looking for a child care provider, is it acceptable to sit in for a period of time and observe before choosing a particular place? Sure. Do most allow you to do that? I would be really mm -hmm. nervous if a provider didn't allow me right, to do that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so it would be really important, and I would suggest that you do that. My children, because I have grandchildren, and they were looking for child care, and I tell them the best way to tell what kind of child care provider you have is to drop in when they're not expecting you and watch what's going on on those times when they don't know you're going to be coming to the door, because that's when you can really tell the quality of the program is to watch them when they're interacting with your, chil your child. That's really right. good. What, see how they react to your asking if right. you can sit in. And yeah. yeah, That's good. Another good resource for parents, if you don't mind me yeah. telling you, is um, for both families and for centers, there is what's called a parent guide that is also on our website. It's actually on our website, but it's under the technical assistance information on our website. But it's really helpful because it kind of gives a brief summary of the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to read all 32 pages of the rules. They can get that brief summary of it. But it also has our contact information so on, that, on those pages so that if they ever want to contact us about a concern they have with their providers, then it has that there so that they can. That's so great. And your website has been on our screen tonight. Just great. want to make Thank sure you. all the viewers know that they can contact these great ladies and get all the resources that they provide and the other agencies that they work with. And we've been so happy to take calls from our viewers tonight. Want to remind you that that toll free number is on the screen, 855-801-1980, as we're talking about finding quality childcare. And I'm just fascinated by all of the resources that are there, both for parents and providers that your group and the other agencies offer. It's just amazing. It is helpful. We want to be a good resource to them and also make sure that the, the providers are staying in compliance with the rules and the parents are aware of that. Well, it's the most important thing that we can do is to take care of those kids. So thank you so much, Carrie and Joyce, for taking your time and sharing your insight with all of us tonight. Thanks for allowing and us to yeah, come. Thank for, thanks for inviting us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When equipped with the proper programs and resources, parents can feel more confident in choosing the right child care provider for their family. We hope that when the time comes, you'll consider the information that we've discussed this evening in making your choice. KBYO 11 has a strong commitment to providing Utah's parents, children, and families with quality programming and with quality information. We hope you'll allow us to be a bridge between your family and the resources available in the community. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'd also like you to know that we want to know what you think of the material that we've talked about tonight. So please visit our website at kbyu11.org to leave your response at our website. And you can also review some of the information presented tonight by clicking on the Community tab. Another valuable resource that's available is 211 Information and Referral. By dialing 211, that will connect you to an operator who can answer your questions on a wide variety of topics and direct you to the proper helps and agencies in your community. 211 Information and Referral is a statewide service and it's free and confidential. We hope you'll join us next week when Ask 11 will continue discussing the state of Utah's children. 
will present another live program in which you'll be able to call in and ask members of the United Way of Utah County about their program called Help Me Grow. So we hope you'll join us. I'm Tracy Christensen for everyone here at Ask 11. Thanks for being with us. Good night.